just again want to welcome everybody and thank all of you for being here as as some of you might remember this was originally scheduled to happen at the end of august and then with the fire and so much um so much happening with so many people having to be displaced we thought it would be best to postpone and reschedule so we're very grateful to all of you for coming back and, and participating in this new date. We're very grateful to all of our presenters today from the County Office of Education for being available, um, for being willing to postpone at the last minute uh, in August and then being willing and available to come back today. So we have um, joining us today, Dr. Ferris Sabah, who's the County Superintendent of Schools, and Jason Borgen, who's the Chief Technology Officer Debbie Bodenheimer, the Associate Superintendent of Educational Services, and Stephanie Sumarna, who's the Distance Learning Special Teacher on Assignment. So we have an awesome team to share information with us today. So thank you all. Uh, I do wanna mention that today, I, normally my co-host is Nicole Lezen. She and I are both uh, consultants that facilitate this countywide initiative called Core Investments. Nicole is unable to join us today, and so Christine Seberg has graciously stepped in to be my co-host today. She'll be helping to manage the, the chat box and, and helping me keep an eye on what kinds of questions or, or comments are coming through. Uh, and then we have Stella Lauerman, who is our interpreter for today, and also translated all of the slides, which we'll send out again after today's uh, session, so that all the materials and the recordings will be available in both English and Spanish. And just a very quick overview of CORE. I know some of you have heard this multiple times, um, but I feel like it's it's can never be repeated too too often. CORE is a countywide, it's not even really a project or initiative, but it's hard to find another word for it. Um, but it's a process that we've been facilitating that involves multiple partners from nonprofits, public agencies, philanthropy, community groups. And it's really evolving into both a funding model and a movement to achieve equitable health and well-being in our county using a results-based collective impact approach that's responsive to community needs. And through a lot of community input and, and feedback from various partners, uh, we've developed this mission and vision for CORE that's really centered around, again, collective action, health, equitable opportunities. And again, you can see equity front and center in all of that. And as we think about how we achieve that vision of, of equity, uh, it really requires us to, to think about and acknowledge and be explicit about the connections between what we call these core conditions for health and well being. And that these are uh, opportunities and resources and um, kind of aspects of quality of life that every person should be able to experience across the lifespan, regardless of race or ethnicity or gender or sexual identity or sexual orientation, immigration status, all of those. Um, and so often, you know, in our work, we approach these issues as single issues, right? What do we do about health and wellness? What do we do about housing? And really we're trying to say that uh, in order to achieve that vision of equitable health and well-being, we have to understand and address the intersections and connections of these core conditions. And so today we'll be uh, focusing on and, and hearing about uh, what's happening in our community in terms of uh, trying to ensure digital equity and, and resources and support that's being offered around distance learning and that fits within our core condition around lifelong learning and education. But as many of you know that all, uh, being able to achieve that digital equity also relies on uh, paying attention to and addressing some of these other aspects of health and well-being as well. And so again, I'm very pleased to have as our guests today, um, Dr. Sabah and Jason and Debbie and Stephanie, and I'm going to turn it right over to them because they have a lot of uh, fabulous information to share with us today. Um, I, I know that just from you know my work at the County Office of Education, they have been relentless, working tirelessly from the from the get go, from the first moment that schools had to be closed down, you know, trying to develop a um, a good process for supporting students and families and and educators uh, during the shelter in place, and then as everyone was thinking about the reading or what distance learning would look like, 
in this new reality. Um, they had been doing so much behind the scenes work and support that uh, we'll hear about today. So thank you so much again to all of you for being here. Um, and I'll just say a final reminder, feel free to ask your questions share your comments in the chat box throughout the presentation. And uh, after we hear from each of our speakers, then we'll have a chance to, to try to address some of those questions um, as many as we can today. So with that, Ferris, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Nicole. And um, thanks uh, to everybody who's, who's uh, listening in and, and participating in the Zoom meetings. I've, I've always been so appreciative of, uh, of, Nicole, of the two Nicoles and their work in kind of creating this opportunity for us to uh, share and learn from each other and always with a focus on equity. And, and this issue of digital equity is, is a, a really an interesting dimension of, of, of the, our work and our commitment to social justice. Because I think that you probably would agree that connectivity uh, for and all of the information that's out there, the ways that we share information and gather information is a basic right that we want to have each and every one of our members of our community should be able to have access to. And um, I, uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about, uh, about our efforts in collaboration with our school districts and other partners in the community. But before we get started, I'd like to introduce the team of folks or have the, the team of folks from the County Office of Education who are involved in different aspects of this work. Uh, to introduce themselves. So I'll start with myself, Ferris Sabal, County Superintendent of Schools. And I uh, am honored to uh, be joined by several folks who are here with us. I'll ask Jason to introduce himself and his role. Jason, before you do that, I, I realize I need to press the record for the English version. So hold on just a second. <laughs> okay. Okay, go ahead. Wonderful. All right, good go morning, on, Jason. Good morning, everyone. Uh, and I've done that several times during many professional development sessions. You forget to push the record button. Um, and then you just have to do it again, right? Uh, I am Jason Borgen, uh, Chief Technology Officer for Santa Cruz County Office of Education. But my background is, number one, I'm an educator. And so uh, supporting our students and ultimately making sure they have the most sound education possible in the 21st century. Uh, Debbie? Thank you. Hi, I'm Debbie Bodenheimer. I'm the Associate Superintendent of Ed Services at the County Office of Education. And previously I was in San Lorenzo Valley for five years and I'm absolutely an educator, a former teacher, and very happy to be here today to share what we are doing and to answer questions. And Stephanie? Yeah, hi, I'm Stephanie Sumarna um, and I joined the Santa Cruz County Office of Education this summer in July as a teacher on special assignment to support schools and districts and teachers in distance learning. And just like Jason and Debbie, um, also a lifelong educator, I am coming from Bonnie June Elementary School where I taught third grade for eight years. So I'm very excited to be here today. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Stephanie. And, and, uh, and so uh, this, uh, who you're gonna be hearing from today is part of our team of folks who is really working on the different components of, of, of digital equity. And we'll be talking about what digital equity means and how, it, how important it is to distance learning, which is the learning environment that most of our students in the county are, 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 living, are living with and, and uh, learning from. I'd like to uh, give you a little bit of information about the County Office of Education for those of you that don't know. Uh, we work with, uh, we're an educational kind of overarching agency. We work with 10 different school districts in the county. Some of them are huge, like Pajar Valley and Five School District with 20,000 students. Some of them are pretty small, like Happy Valley with uh, about 100 students. And so we, uh, there's a, a great range and diversity in our, in our, in when it comes to both ethnicity and, and income levels and, uh, you know, the zip codes really uh, create a, a very different kind of population across the county and also different kinds of needs for those for those uh, school districts. And our job is really to provide services uh, and support those those organizations, but also we're our own school district. We serve our own students, uh, our alternative education students, many who have been unsuccessful in the traditional schools, they come to us or they've been expelled uh, or they wanted a kind of a different type of learning modality. Uh, for when it comes to their, their, uh, their preparations for, for high school uh, graduation as well as uh, college and a career. Uh, and so we're also the internet service provider for all of the school districts in the county. 
And uh, we play an important role in a variety of different contexts with that, with that support, both in both infrastructure and in, in terms of uh, the, the, the kind of the instructional, the learning aspect of it. Uh, our county is, is diverse in, in, in some ways, a representative of California with 53% of our, of our families qualifying for free and reduced lunch and 24% of our students are English language learners. However, almost the great majority of those students are located in, uh, in the southern part of our county. And there are pockets in different other areas in, uh, in the northern part of our county. But it is the, 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 the different kinds of strengths and experiences and needs that students bring do vary and it does present different kinds of challenges. For example, a family that is unable to connect because they live at a, of a, of a migrant labor camp uh, you know, the ability for us to be able to provide infrastructure uh, is, can be hampered by, by the fact that maybe it is more difficult to raise funds to provide those kinds of support services. And so, so we're always aware about the, the challenges that our families are meeting and recognize that this is yet another example where, where the inequities in our society have, are, are exemplified. Uh, their lack of access. Uh, the, if you come from a low-income family, the likelihood that you do not have broadband connectivity as, as we think you should have is, is, is much more likely in our, in our county. And so those, we see our role as a county office to overcome those challenges and be able to work towards this, this goal of having everybody with broadband connectivity uh, you know, for 100% of our families. Another uh, kind of in our strategic plan, which Nicole uh, expertly in the next slide, please, Jason. Uh, no, the one before that. Oh, you didn't update. I thought that we were using the, uh, the, uh, the slide deck. I, I guess you moved them over to a different slide deck. Um, that's okay. So um, I uh, wanted to share a little bit about our strategic planning process and how we see digital equity as part of our of our uh, of of our uh, of our mission. Um, equity is at the heart of everything that we do at the County Office of Education. We see ourselves as part of a system, an organization that is dedicated to overcoming the, the inequities that exist, to dismantling uh, uh, those those inequities, those inequitable systems, and to build systems that are. Uh, part of that, uh, an equitable, you know, we want to build equity, we want to build access, we want to ensure that we're providing the supports that, that help students uh, reach their potential, that overcome those challenges and break those cycles of, 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 uh, of poverty that, that have existed and, and uh, that, that exists in our, in our community and, and, and almost any measure of success that you look at. Uh, whether it's high school graduation, whether it's going to college, whether uh, you're going to be able to get a, a job that will sustain uh, your family, the, your, the characteristics that you, that you bring with you to, to, uh, to this community are going to have a huge impact and are correlated very highly with the kind, those characteristics and your ability to be successful. So if you are an African-American student, if you're a Latinx uh, uh, student, if you uh, have, exp are, if your identity as a as an LGBTQ plus uh, individual, those kinds of components have a huge impact on the likelihood of success in our in our educational system and our in our society at large. And so we we recognize that we have deep deep issues that we have to overcome, and internet uh, connectivity is one of those challenges. We have a lot of families that have experienced a lot of a lot of challenges, and you're going to be hearing more about the kinds of things that we've been working on to overcome them. So in terms of defining the different dimensions of this, uh, you know, we use the term equity uh, as, and we've defined it in our, in, in, in our county offices as it's what transforms our systems to disrupt the effects of oppression and privilege so all learners can achieve and thrive. So it's kind of a focus on, uh, on, on, on our learners, our, our, our students that uh, across the county. We have 40,000 of them who are in our K-12 schools and probably another 10,000 or so that are in different, uh, maybe a little bit less, who will go to a variety of different uh, private schools, home schools. But we really see our, our role as, as that, that we're working towards equity. Now, digital equity um, specifically is related to ensuring that all students have access to um, standard internet connectivity, uh, devices and ability to safely utilize digital technologies and with funding support mechanisms that are put in place for families that cannot afford these, these rights. 
So the idea is that you, there's different dimensions to digital equity. One is the physical connection, the having, a, having an internet service, having a device that can connect to it, and then the ability to be able to utilize it. Uh, it's, it's one thing to give somebody a, a hotspot or a, a cable connection, but if they're not able to use that technology, it's not very useful. Uh, the other, the other uh, piece related to this is that, is that the FCC has defined uh, broadband as the goal, and broadband is defined as 25 megabits per second uh, as a download speed. And that's pretty fast. Uh, I mean, it's a good speed, but the more that we are moving towards the kind of a high content environment where we're able to download videos and be able to interact in a, with, in, with a more robust uh, levels of, of information, we need to have uh, a, lot of, a lot higher quality connections than we currently have. And so a lot of families who have old DSL or even dial-up or folks that have been getting these hotspots that we've been putting out by the thousands to families do not meet that. And in many cases, um, do not give that kind of connectivity that we think that families deserve. And many times we want to connect more than one device. We want to be able to help not only a single student who's working on their homework, but we want to make sure that anybody who's in that, in, in there, in the family is able to, to get that, uh, that, uh, those, um, that kind of connectivity. And I'm going to have uh, uh, Jason uh, talk to us about the next uh, four bullets on this, on this slide. Thank you, Ferris. Thanks for setting that tone. Um, and just by a quick check for understanding, we want to make sure we know who's here and try to make this as interactive as possible. So if you don't mind clicking on the participant list, uh, you should see a little button with two people on it. Click on the participant window and you should see on the bottom a yes or no, a yes or no button. Um, how many folks in here are educators? Please do a yes or no with the green button. Again, how many people are in education or are currently educators? And again, uh, this gives us a quick check for understanding and collects the data needed in a synchronous session. And so I'm just quickly getting the information. It looks like about 22 who've responded, 23 are educators and 23 are not. So we have a big uh, mix here. I'm gonna clear that data. Uh, how many people are parents of, of K-12 students? Yes or no? Parents of K-12 students, again, we have split about 50-50, I'm seeing the data come in. So again, I'm doing a quick check for understanding and I'm modeling a tool that is being used currently in your students' Zoom classes as well. Uh, so again, it's a quick way to interact in a synchronous Zoom meeting and a quick way to collect some data as an instructor. Uh, and so I'm gonna go ahead and clear those results here. And uh, so distance learning, about half of the folks who are educators know exactly how we define distance learning uh, and even the parents who've been in the midst of distance learning, understand the aspects of distance. Distance learning is just any type of learning that takes place outside of the brick and mortar schoolhouse. And so even if a student gets a packet and they do that packet at home, that's considered distance learning. Uh, providing a Zoom meeting session, a live interactive session, that is considered distance learning. Uh, going into Google Classroom or logging into a learning management system, which I'll talk about in a moment, is considered distance learning. And so any learning that takes place outside of the brick and mortar classroom that's provided support by an instructional uh, facilitator or a teacher. Um, synchronous learning. Synchronous learning is learning that takes place simultaneously with an instructor. Like this is a synchronous session. Uh, students are required to partake in synchronous learning every day, which we'll talk about in a moment through a new legislation. Uh, asynchronous learning. Asynchronous learning is happening all the time. That is learning that's done outside of a simultaneous session. For example, uh, if a teacher instructs a student to complete a worksheet or a document, they can do that on their own time. They have some choice of when and how they do that and where they do that. So that is asynchronous. It's not at the same time as everybody else doing, this, the, doing the project. So that really allows the students to find the time that's right for them to complete the assignment. And so that's considered asynchronous learning. Learning management system. Uh, a learning management system uh, is a system that delivers tech, uh, learning, uh, learning tools. For example, uh, Google Classroom is considered a learning management system. It is a system where a teacher can deliver instruction, deliver announcements, and deliver resources all in one existing piece of software or, or system. So if you've ever taken an online class, you've probably got that, uh, received the online class instruction through a learning management system, such as Canvas, Moodle, 
Um, there's lots of other learning management tools out there specifically. Um, and so those are kind of the, 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 the specific terminology we'll be using throughout this whole session and to discuss uh, that as, as we help students uh, acquire distance learning, access distance learning, all these pieces play a huge role in their distance learning experience, not only for students, but for instructors and for school administrators, as well as for parents. And so we wanna make sure we're clear on these definitions. Thanks, Jason. So uh, one of the reasons why this, uh, if we can go to the next slide, um, one of the reasons this, all of this has become so much more urgent and important, of course, is because of COVID-19, right? It, when March came along and, and we recognized the need uh, to really transition and transform our, our, our way of working with students, we recognized that we all hands had to be on deck on this and that we were gonna be, that the challenges that our students were gonna be facing uh, meant that we had to really start thinking about about how we're gonna do things differently. How are we gonna be able to deliver, really transform our educational system to be able to meet this new challenge, which was that we had to work remotely with our students. And so this internet connectivity all of a sudden became the top priority for us. And we really started working together with all the school districts. If you go to the next slide, Jason. Um, all of the school districts, we started, we developed really a, a strong, and we continue to have this really strong bond between all the school districts, trying to work together in unison. Um, working together, support each other to create common tools and try to get as much consistency as possible. And so you'll see there part of a letter there, but you have the names. We're, we've been sending out these letters together as a community, of, as education, a public education community. Uh, we work together to transition to distance learning. It was done very, very quickly, in some cases within a matter of days. Um, we've been sharing resources together, trying to help each other with be those best practices offering similar professional development. Um, I meet twice a week with the superintendents and we talk about all kinds of issues. And right now we're talking about the, the, the guidance from the governor about reopening schools and, and whether we're gonna be doing small groups, if whether we're gonna be looking at elementary waivers and working very closely with public health and trying to put out as much communication as possible. And the concept of internet connectivity and, and, uh, or connectivity in general has been such an important focus for so many because if you don't have it, a lot of the resources that we've been working on have not been available to our families. And so that's something that has been so important to us and really mobilizes us as a group to, to work together to try to figure out how we can overcome this huge gap that exists for many of our families and not, not, not having this, the, the resources to be able to connect. Next slide. One of the things we developed uh, is a reopening framework for schools. And it, basically this is all about health guidance, but, but the part of our partnership was also working closely with public health, putting a lot, lot of resources online and making those, those resources available to our families. And a lot of it was really trying to clarify what, the, what, the, uh, what school would look like in person to how do we minimize the risk for students, staff and family and uh, at the same time, trying to maximize the ability to connect with, uh, with, with, with students. And we're now in the phase where we're looking at some in-person components, but I don't believe that internet, that the connectivity piece, the remote connectivity, the, the distance learning aspect is gonna go away. I think that as we slowly transition and um, over the next few months and years into a, an environment that somewhat resembles what we were used to before COVID-19, there was still gonna be a huge important presence of uh, or an access to, to uh, distance learning and these, these the, and so internet connectivity is, is gonna to continue to be extremely important. Next slide. So when we look at Maslow's hierarchy, you'll see that, that you know, some of the basic human needs from, from the basic survival components all the way up to self-actualization you know, one of the things that, that Maslow didn't have in, in his day was, was uh, the concept of internet connectivity. And we see this now as something that is so fundamental, so important that it is at the lower levels of, of this hierarchy. And when I think about, you know, uh, my kids who are doing distance learning right now as we speak, uh, when I think about the challenges that our families have experienced, when I think about things like food insecurity, the number of resources that are available, so much of that, some, so much of those resources are only accessible if you know about them. And 
and you only can know about them if information is communicated to you. There is absolutely no reason why a family should go hungry in Santa Cruz County, but if you don't know where the Second Harvest Food Bank locations are, you would go hungry or you could go hungry. And so many of our families are experiencing such uh, difficult times because of the fires, because of COVID-19, and there is such an abundance of resources, so much of a commitment from, from different agencies and organizations to help. But connecting people to those resources is extremely important. We launched a, a, an initiative to provide mental health services for people who've experienced trauma as a result of the fires. And the biggest challenge was not gathering uh, all the nonprofit agencies that provide those kinds of services like PVPSA and Encompass and Community Bridges and so on. It was about how do we get families to those services. And so the internet connectivity um, is a fundamental right. And we think that it is a necessary, it is a lifeline for families because a lot of those, uh, those other needs like, like home, sec home, home security and, and, um, and uh, or, or food, food security, um, having shelter, um, all those components uh, are, uh, to be able to achieve those, you're gonna need that connectivity. And so we see that as something that is extremely important and something that we're striving for. Next, next uh, Jason. Here's an example of something that we launched. It's a, it's a Google map that has all the food location, food distribution locations online. Really great if you have a phone or a, a, uh, or a device that allow you to connect to it, but very, very challenging. Um, you, you have, you, maybe if you have a phone, you could call 211 and, and walk through the process to get to it. But really internet connectivity, being able to access these resources is super important. And this was a quick example of how somebody could quickly find all the different locations because the districts mobilized very quickly to provide different and, and community agencies to create all of these, these locations. But again, the information wasn't necessarily there for uh, if you didn't have internet connectivity. And we're, you're gonna be hearing a little bit that when we started this process, one, one in five of our families did not have internet connectivity in March. That's one in five. And, and of course, unfortunately, the folks that needed it most, folks who come from our, our low income uh, uh, income levels, folks that have been disenfranchised, uh, uh, generation after generation are the same ones that didn't have internet connectivity and were it made it more difficult for them to access the resources that were available to them. And so here's a, a, a video you may have seen before of people building a plane as it's flying. Um, the urgency that we have as a result of COVID-19 uh, is, is it, it, it felt like it continues to feel this way with our schools. We, we, not only is it that the plane has not been built because we've never dealt with the kinds of challenges that we're facing, including how to create infrastructure and systems to help support parents to develop the skills they need to use the devices that are there, but it also, uh, it also is that things change all the time. We were using the, the governor's uh, county monitoring list one day and then the next day we find out the blueprint for a safer economy is there and everything is, is, has been reset and now we are told that schools can reopen on Tuesday, the September 22nd in Santa Cruz County, which just rocks the system and makes it really, really difficult. And so there's a lot of moving parts and our job we see is to try to be consistent, continue pushing towards equity, continue pushing for digital equity in this case, um, regardless of, of the winds and storms that we're, we're, we're driving through, or sometimes the, the, the smoke that we're driving through as, as we're moving towards this, and to keep our focus on our students and our families and ensuring that they have the resources they need to be successful. And so I'm gonna um, ask Jason to talk to us about distance learning specifically, because that's an important component of this, is the learning uh, aspect and all that goes into making sure that students can have a successful educational experience. Jason? Thank you, Ferris, and thanks for setting that foundation and, and, and your leadership here and in, in, in bringing the whole 40,000 students and, and all their parents and families together, as well as all the nonprofits. It's been amazing work over the last few months, and I think the ability for us to continue to build this plane as we're flying it, I don't think anyone would jump in that plane to fly somewhere. And so we ask your patience as we move forward and try to build these schools as we're flying it. And we don't want to place students in schools until we're fully ready and everything's ready for those students specifically. Um, and so um, we've been uh, promoting a book that's just got actually uh, published this summer 
uh, by a well-known educational publisher named Corwin Press. Uh, they created a, uh, they published a book called The Distance Learning Playbook that was uh, written and developed by three educational researchers, uh, two of them out of uh, UC, uh, UC San Diego specifically, uh, Nancy Frey and Douglas Fisher. Uh, and, and one quote really stood out me, stood so that mean through that book was the opportunity to engage students in different ways. Distance learning, I know it's struggling. It's a struggle for many families, many parents, many educators, many educational institutions and systems. But we come at, come at, at the county office as an opportunity, an opportunity to serve students who may have not been served the best way. Opportunity to personalize and individualize education and instruction for those students. And so although we all many educators and many students and administrators are struggling with the implementation of the process, we're also going at it as an opportunity to support students and really engage students in true learning opportunities. And so it's, it's, it's our system has been uh, basically transformed in five, six months. In education. Teachers had to rethink the way they teach, they deliver instruction. And so we're in kind of a, 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 uh, a hole a little bit on implementing, but we have an opportunity to increase that and really increase our support and efforts to students. Uh, I myself have been a, a studying and researching and training in online learning for many, many years. And so it's an opportunity I've seen over the past 10 to 15 years to get more and more educators on board. And unfortunately now they're forced to get on board with online learning, but it, it has that definitely does provide an opportunity moving forward. Um, I want to show this analogy of kind of what our distance learning pathway has guided us in. Um, I'm going to use a house uh, to explain this analogy. Uh, and so as you heard from Ferris, the, the start of, of any distance learning program needs to start with broadband and internet access to create a feedback loop for teachers and students with who are not meeting face-to-face. -face. They need a program to deliver content, deliver instruction, to monitor student instruction and student assignments, and to give feedback to students, both positive and con uh, constructive feedback to those students. And so, like when you build a house, you have to build the foundational first. The foundation of distance learning is infrastructure is those devices and those connectivity. So if you're familiar with the way the districts have been pushing out distance learning programs, the first piece was to hand out those devices, getting a, a assessing who has devices, who has internet connectivity. And so that was the foundational piece. And that's still occurring because things change. We have new, we have mobility in, in all parts of the county where students come in, students leave. Um, and so this is the essential piece. This is the foundational to any distance learning program is infrastructure. And then of course, uh, you need supports. You need beams, just like in a house. You need to build the support structure. And so that support is not just for the students. It's also for the educators. Educators need to learn, need to understand this new pedagogy, this new teaching and learning mindset. They need to learn how to personalize, how to deliver instruction, how to communicate to families at a distance, how to communicate to students at a distance. And so these support structures were key. Uh, and that's ha been happening in March. It happened, uh, we initiated in March. It's been happening all summer long and into the fall as well. And then of course, you need to ensure students are safe. Parents feel safe, secure. Teachers are building that relationship. So we need protection. Students need to feel like they're protected at a distance. And so just like you have insulation on a house, you need to protect the students as well through that process. And then finally, once everything is set up and the house is built, Right, then you can customize where you put the windows, where you put the doors. We realize there's a big shift in, um, and a, a need, the needs differ in Pajaro Valley Unified School District, for example, and then in San Lorenzo Valley Unified School District, completely two different districts. And so we need to customize supports at the county office level for those individual needs of each individual district. And so we're customizing, and that's what the county office is do, doing around those support efforts, is creating those customizations and creating open door access for for those teachers, those educators, those administrators, those families to connect with us for guidance and support moving forward. Uh, and so with that, let's quickly talk about all these pieces of distance learning. Uh, first, starting at the foundational piece, infrastructure. Uh, our big mantra is not just close the digital divide, but to diminish it, completely get rid of it. And so what we've done over the past several months is uh, we work closely with a local uh, uh, company, internet service provider called Cruzio. Uh, Cruzio has been a big partner since March with the County Office of Education and many of the districts where we've set up a, a simplified way for families who, uh, who are of low income 
who are low socioeconomically to submit their request to get free internet access. And Cruzio has been actually delivering this free internet access to these families at their homes for 60 to 90 days or more. And so uh, it streamlines the whole process. There's also Comcast and Spectrum also offer low cost internet as well. But the process to get a hold of a, rep a representative at Comcast and or Spectrum is, is, is huge because they're huge conglomerate companies, big companies. Um, and it's very, very hard to talk to somebody there. There's a lot of red tape and paperwork that has to be completed. Uh, we've worked closely with Cruzio at the county level to streamline the whole process to get request internet through Cruzio's service, right? We wanna make sure students have that high speed internet to ensure they can submit and work on distance learning. Uh, for those families who Cruzio don't, do not reach, we've also worked closely with many of the districts and Cruzio to set up what we're calling parking lot Wi-Fi zones. These parking lot Wi-Fi zones are set up uh, at many different school sites, including um, uh, Branson 40 Small Campus, uh, over on SoCal uh, Mountain School over in SoCal Road, uh, and Pacific School over in Davenport. And so these are places that uh, Cruzio work closely with the district and the county application to set up outdoor Wi-Fi access that uh, carries a signal over a thousand feet. So parents and families can sit outside the car in the parking lot, outside on the road, and actually get access to the internet that way. And so if a student has a Chromebook, the students can work off the, on their Chromebooks offline and then go to the parking lot to actually submit their work and get connected to the internet. And so that's one way to submit their work um, and you know read their feedback from their from their teachers if they don't want to sit and do the work in the in the car in the parking lot. Um, and so we've also created a map that's on our distance learning website of all countywide free public access to Wi-Fi. Uh, we know there's people all over the county that need access to this, and so this map showcases and highlights. Uh, different areas, including um, libraries, public areas, government buildings, schools, and FedEx offices. And so all these places offer free internet services as well. Uh, many districts, as a couple of folks mentioned, are uh, also handing out hotspots. These are uh, 4G LTE hotspots uh, provided either by T-Mobile or Verizon for those families who do not, do not have internet. These hotspots are basically like cell phones that you can connect Chromebooks to, devices to, up to 10 devices. Um, and many districts are partnering with these companies to actually get unlimited data on these hotspots. Uh, you and I, if we purchase a consumer-based hotspot, uh, they have uh, their limited data you can download. Uh, working closely with schools and through these school programs, through these providers like T-Mobile and Verizon, they offer unlimited data on these services. And so we're working closely with both T-Mobile and, um, and Verizon specifically on accessing these hotspots. Uh, and we're trying to uh, limit the cost for the districts as well. We're actually setting up a private network um, at our County Office of Ed to uh, provide internet across Verizon's data networks as well. And so we're trying to increase those efforts um, moving forward. And finally, uh, we, in order to uh, do this, it really takes a village. We created a, uh, a Digital Equity uh, Advisory Leadership Team, or DELT, Digital Equity Advisory Leadership Team, that uh, sees uh, many familiar faces here who are on this team, including, um, I, don't, I can't name them all, but Level Cradle to Career program has, an, uh, has a seat at that table. Um, we have some folks from Monterey Bay Economic uh, Consortium on that. Uh, digital advisory team as well, as well as some of the bigger district superintendents uh, making a plan to really diminish that digital divide. Uh, so again, this is foundational to any distance learning program and really any uh, any societal program in Santa Cruz County. We want to make sure we provide the skills, not only just the internet connectivity, but also the teaching and learning, the literacy. It, the, with technology and with computers and with internet comes a digital literacy and understanding how to use these devices successfully. So we're slowly working on training these families and parents as well as how to use these successfully to communicate and, and, and get things done uh, in the community and elsewhere. All right, so uh, with that, uh, I wanna just quickly talk about some of the, once the infrastructure there, uh, I wanna, uh, wanna uh, showcase some of the tools that are being used, some of the learning management tools that are being used across the county. Obviously, every single school district have their own governing boards and have their own um, decision-making powers. However, we're really trying to standardize and recommend uh, what tools are being used across the county to be able to and support it at a county level. And so uh, you probably 
devices being used across Santa Cruz County uh, are Chromebooks. And Chromebooks work well because every single one of, uh, every single public school district in Santa Cruz County are what they call Google for Education customers. Every single school district uh, has access of, to Gmail, has access to Google Drive. And so every single uh, district in Santa Cruz County are with Google for Education customers. Google offers free service for all K-12 education. And so this is a free service that's provided by Google to all school districts uh, in, in, in the world. Um, and so that's why Chromebooks has been kind of the top de type of device being recommended. It integrates very, very well. Uh, it, Chromebooks are uh, developed, the operating system is developed by Google. Um, and so it integrates very, very well with all the tools being used by teachers, schools, and students today. Uh, as far as learning management systems go, uh, most districts in our county are using Google Classroom. Again, it integrates well with Chromebooks and many other devices, and it's very simple for young students to use. Uh, I've seen kindergartens use Google Classroom uh, very successfully. Um, other systems that are being used more at the kindergarten, first grade, and second grade level is a tool called Seesaw. Seesaw is a tool that's easily accessible by both students and parents, and students can actually interact within the app. It's also a content delivery tool where teachers can put an assignment up there and ask students to submit it. Once the students submit the assignment in this, in this tool called Seesaw, this teacher then gets a, a notification and can give the students uh, feedback directly within Seesaw, not leaving the program. So it's, simple, it's simplified for those young kids who have a little bit harder time accessing the tools. And then finally, for synchronous live interaction sessions, uh, most districts are using Zoom, which we're using now. Uh, we do have a, a, a couple districts or a couple schools using a tool called Google Meet, which is Google's version of video conferencing system. And so these are the main two video conferencing systems being used in our county. Chromebooks are the devices and Google Classroom and Seesaw are mostly the uh, learning management systems used. We do have a couple charter schools and things uh, that are using other more comprehensive learning management systems at the secondary level, at the high school level, such as Canvas. For example, one of our charter schools is using the Canvas learning management system. All right, and so uh, I'm gonna hand it over to Debbie to talk about uh, the compliance and, and what's driving all these shifts in our educational model, as well as uh, uh, some of the, the, the things that are coming down at the statewide level. All right, thank you, Jason. Um, so as you might imagine, the California Department of Education is definitely monitoring really carefully to make sure that the uh, distance learning is being monitored by every district and every school site. And so it's required that there is daily live interaction for students. And we've been working really carefully with our schools and districts to make sure that they are recording this um, and that they are logging in to make sure that all students are engaged and that they are not um, missing out on their distance learning. So there's the requirement that they have to meet the daily instructional minutes um, and they can do that through synchronous learning, which is obviously on um, you know, FaceTime, in-time learning and with asynchronous learning as well. And so our districts have done a really great job to create plans to make sure that they're keeping track of attendance and that they're keeping track of the minutes. The other thing that came out that was really critical was to make sure that the distance learning is still really rigorous and that students have rigorous learning opportunities and that they're working at grade level and they're working on standards and mastery. And so again, we've been working with our different subcommittees and our curriculum and instruction committee to make sure that the distance learning opportunities are really strong, they're engaging, they are based on standards, and it's not just busy work to keep students busy during the day. And then all districts had to adopt a new plan. This actually is a requirement that is due September 30th, that they have to have a learning and continuity attendance plan to make sure, again, that they are accounting for how students are learning through distance learning and how they are keeping track of attendance so that we know that no students are slipping through the cracks. And so you can check that in your district. They have to be approved by the school board and so they will be in the school board packets and in the minutes. And then this, the county office actually does the final approval for all of those plans. And so uh, all these specific requirements came down with uh, the new budget bill, uh, which they're calling Senate Bill 98 uh, 
from uh, f from the state government and legis the legislator legislatures out in the state government. Um, and so Stephanie is going to talk a little about the training and guidance support that we're being providing over uh, the course of the last uh, five or six months. And before she does that, I do want to identify just kind of big picture what we're doing at the county, what our focus is, and what teachers' focuses are around distance learning. And so this actually came directly from the distance learning playbook as well. Um, the idea of teachers first need to connect with their students, make connections, build that rapport so the students feel comfortable. And at that point, they need to have a communication plan, not only to communicate to their students, but also to communicate to families on the steps and protocols taken to ensure the students have access to the learning environment. And then finally, after the connection and communication is done, then the teaching can happen. And so you're probably aware the first week if your student was in distance learning was all about connecting to that student, making those connections, building those connections, building that rapport. You can't teach somebody, an uh, adolescent or a young child, um, unless you have a rapport with that student and the student's not gonna feel comfortable. And so that's, uh, that's number one. And so also ensuring that the requirements and norms and expectations are communicated and, and uh, institutionalized not only by the child, but also by the families and parents. Then the teaching can happen. Once the teaching happens, the, the teachers are ongoingly assessing that child for success or uh, uh, reteaching abilities. If the, if the students or many of the students are not meeting uh, the requirements of the of being successful around the learning uh, plans or the learning acquisition, then at that time, the teacher has to then reteach. So assessment is happening on an ongoing basis. They're continuously assessing whether they're making direct connections with the students. Again, this is where the opportunities provide. Uh, this is where the, the students have opportunities to really make the individual connections with the teachers and the teachers can individually connect with their students. Teachers now have the opportunity to do one-on-one -on -one uh, sessions with individual students, small group sessions with individual students. They're not necessarily stuck in the same class with 30 kids for six hours a day. And so they can make easily interventions with individual groups of kids needing more support or needing interventions and provide another 20 minute, 30 minute session synchronously using Zoom or Google Meet with students who are more advanced and help get them more uh, advanced at an advanced rate. And so there's lots of opportunities to connect with, with different learning modalities and, and uh, students with diff at different skill levels. And then finally, this is all new for the teachers. Most of these teachers have never taught fully online, have experienced adolescence fully online. So it gives an opportunity for the teachers to ongoingly reflect on their practices. And we wanna make sure that's, that teachers have time in their day and or week to reflect on their practices and make changes needed. It's the first, they're, they're doing something for the first time, knowing that this is, they need to, they're gonna have iterations, many, many different changes to the way they teach, deliver instruction and communicate. So it's all key in, in, in distance learning. This is, this is the first year of teaching. I always, when I talk to teachers, I say, even though you've been teaching for 25, 30 years, this is your first year of teaching. It really is because it's, it's a new, new format. And so, uh, this kind of shows a timeline of what the county office and how the county office has been supporting distance learning efforts uh, over the past five or six months here. And so uh, in March, when we got the notice that schools were closing within three days or within, uh, within three days, we actually did a week-long professional development training with teachers. We had over 500 teachers sign up for this training. We used a, nationally, a national known curriculum. Uh, called Leading Edge Certification is a nationally developed curriculum uh, focused on online teaching for K-12 teachers specifically. Um, and so we uh, had 500 teachers go through some of that program to teach them the mindsets, the skill sets, and the tool sets needed to be a successful online teacher. And so we did that in March. And then a week later, what teachers had to do is actually start their distance learning. And Again, if you saw the previous slide here, uh, you see that uh, spring, we call that emergency teaching, right? The idea in spring was you want to learn new content, teach students new content. You're trying to prevent the slide. You're trying to keep students engaged and ready to learn during the, during the start of the pandemic. Now we have a new step. We have a new group. Uh, teachers have new classrooms and new classes uh, of students. And so now we're starting afresh and starting anew with new teaching and ensuring that standards are being taught. But it really was an emergency situation in the springtime. 
and teachers learned a lot about their processes, but still there's a lot more to learn in that. Um, and what we did in June, actually, uh, in June, we hosted a distance learning summit uh, for educational leaders. Uh, our feeling at the county office was, in, in, unless administrators, principals, superintendents understand the best practice in distance learning, it's not gonna be able to scale quickly at a school site or district. And so we hosted, uh, with many practitioners all across the world, really, uh, a summit virtually, but hosted by our county office in partnership with uh, Google and a company called CDWG, a leadership summit, where we had over a thousand attendees all over the world, including about 300 educational leaders in Santa Cruz County to set the stage, to set the stage for their planning for the summer. Um, and then we actually uh, decided because there's such a big need for distance learning support to hire Stephanie, hire a distance learning teacher on special assignment. And so that would provide support all across the districts in, in our county to provide guided support and teacher professional development and coaching uh, from a regional perspective. Instead of every single district doing we wanted to provide a regional uh, support structure so not every district had to recreate the wheel. And so that's where we got Stephanie in here to help plan for the next few months. So Stephanie? Yeah, thank you, Jason. And so I loved Jason's analogy of the house and you know the need for the support and the beans. And so I joined the team in July and I came from the perspective of a teacher who had been through that emergency teaching situation in the spring. And so I knew, you know, what teachers needed in terms of support. And then right away, I was able to communicate with admin and district leaders and talk about what they needed for their teams and we pushed out a variety of surveys. And then from that, we were able to sort of notice some themes of what teachers and admin were looking for in terms of supporting the teachers and the students for the fall. And so we hosted a distance learning boot camp right before school started um, that addressed those key themes. So we talked about, you know, like Jason mentioned, community building. We talked about distance learning um, best practices and ways to best you know, attend to things in synchronous and asynchronous sessions. And so those were all addressed um, with that boot camp. And now as we move into the fall, I'm continuing to communicate with um, different admin and districts to customize um, professional development for their school sites and for their teachers to meet the needs as they continue to evolve. So, you know, that image of building the plane as we're flying, the needs are changing, it's not static. And so we're continuing to get input on how we can best support everyone. Next slide, please. Thanks, Stephanie. And, and just with on that too, I, I forgot to mention on this slide, notice there's all these little bubbles. Uh, Throughout this whole process of training and supporting teachers and educators, uh, there are also uh, weekly meetings occurring, which we'll talk about in a, a little bit with district leaders as far as planning on what the reopening structure is going to look like. What is a bell structure going to look like if we go to a hybrid-based learning environment? Knowing that we the planning in the, in the summer was we were thinking we were going to be able to go into a hybrid-based learning environment where 50% of the students were going to be into class. And then what happened in August is the governor came back and said, nope, if you're uh, in this level, of uh, of COVID numbers, of COVID uh, positive tests, then you must completely close down. So at that point, we had to completely pivot to fully distance learning. So all this stuff was happening over the summer months. And so with those committees and the meetings with district leaders, uh, Debbie was kind of a big lead on on supporting those 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 subcommittees. And so Debbie, you want to talk a little about the subcommittee work? Sure, and I'll, I'll try to go quickly because I'm looking at the time and making sure that we're going to have enough time for questions and answers at the end. So, um, but just essentially we created some reopening school subcommittees. We had four different groups who met throughout the summer and we talked about instruction. We talked about possible schedules. We talked about support for student groups, our special ed students, our English learners. Um, and then we talked about student engagement. And so those went on throughout the summer with all of our districts participating. We also created, with the help of Stephanie and the CNI department, um, a distance learning website and also a professional learning plan to really make sure that we were supporting our educators with um, the best um, professional development opportunities possible. 
In addition, we are working really hard in Ed Services to collaborate with the Special Ed Department and also with our Student Services Department to make sure that we're meeting the needs of all of our students. Thanks. And so, so when all the training was going on, the planning and the decision making and logistical setup was also happening concurrently. Uh, and so we're really truly building this plan as we're flying it, right? Uh, and so with that, we want to make sure we provide a set of resources to, uh, to families. So Stephanie's going to talk a little bit about this website of resources. Yeah, so like Debbie and Jason mentioned, we're trying to sort of create a home for all of that support that we're providing so that it's accessible. And Ferris even mentioned earlier, like these resources, you know, people have to know where they are in order for them to have an impact. And so we're trying really hard to communicate over and over that we're collecting all of these resources on our distance learning website as a hub. And so in this website, we have a variety of resources for students, for families, and also for educators. So you can see that Jason sort of scrolling over the educators place where we have a home for upcoming professional development on our calendar. Um, we also have information for the difference between synchronous and asynchronous instruction. We have a collection of professional development and we also are working on creating an organized uh, library of PD that's been pre-recorded. So you can see right now, Jason has up on the screen, we've done some trainings on things like HyperDocs. And so those are up and available for teachers that can go back on demand as they need something. We're also collecting resources here for families. Uh, we recently started a parent resource newsletter. So there was a question in the chat on how we are supporting families in the switch to distance learning. So we're working on collecting resources there um, and working on getting those translated as well so that they are accessible in both English and Spanish. Um, before I joined the team, Jason worked to put together this really nice parent guide for distance learning um, that has all sorts of different ideas for sample schedules and overview of what distance learning should look like at home. Um, and again, the explanation of the different modes of dis distance learning. There's also a collection of content area resources, primarily geared towards educators, but parents can access it too. And so it's a collection of ideas for activities that you can do with your student, um, such as a list of free eBooks and audiobooks, things that parents can do at home and that teachers can access to help support um, distance learning. So again, check it out, uh, dlearning.santacruzcoe.org. We wanted to kind of create a static website where educators, families, and any stakeholder in Santa Cruz County or elsewhere can go to access resources around distance learning. and get an understanding and a foundational uh, understanding of where teachers are and where their teachers are going, and as well as where teachers can provide uh, training from the County Office of Education as well. And so finally, obviously a big component of distance learning is, I mentioned this earlier, is safety and wellness, making sure students feel safe and well, especially those students who, uh, who are special needs, those students who need a little bit of extra support and guidance and nurturing. And so uh, Debbie's gonna talk a little bit about our uh, support for safety and wellness. So uh, Dr. Michael Painter is our Director of Student Services and he couldn't be here today, but he put together this slide and he's been doing an immense amount of work with his department to ensure that families and students and teachers and administrators are getting all of the mental health support that is needed. Obviously the pandemic, the fires, everything that's been happening is, has been really traumatic for our families, for our educators. And so he has created a number of different supports to reach out to families and to educators. Um, he has parent and educator support groups that are being offered internally. And also he works with a lot of different community agencies um, and has a lot of referral agencies that will help as well. He's working specifically in the areas of mindfulness, trauma-informed care, restorative practices, which is a type of uh, moving away from traditional discipline to looking at more restorative justice. Suicide prevention is a huge initiative right now um, to really ensure that, again, that we're looking at the mental health and wellness of all of our students 
and our families and staff. Um, and then just doing a lot of professional development for uh, our community to support people with resilience and psychological first aid. So there is a lot going on with mental health support and the educational services department has also been partnering with student services to make sure that we are sharing resources and that we are promoting the professional development to all of our different networks so that it really reaches the, the right audience as well. Um, and one, one thing I just want to add, if you see this little screenshot here, uh, we have Christine here from, from Triple P, but uh, we're, the Santa Cruz CEO is partnering with Triple P to put on these specific parent events for uh, families raising children with special needs. And so it's a great partnership between uh, Triple P and one of our uh, partners and Santa Cruz County Office of Education as well. Thank you, Jason. And you can see that at the, the last bullet on this um, on the slide is talking about the different partnerships and um, county behavioral health, and then different counseling agencies, and of course, Triple P and Positive Discipline. So uh, this is definitely an area of huge need, and Dr. Painter is working really hard to promote all of these different opportunities to, to support our community in this time. And so Stephanie is gonna kind of lead us out uh, before we get to Q&A on some customizing and personalization uh, how we're doing that for each district and program based upon making those custom support structures to ensure every student has access to the instruction. Yeah, and I just wanted to reference um, to Debbie's slide really quick where she was talking about Michael Painter. Speaking from a parent's perspective, I have a daughter who's kinder age. Um, the parenting workshops are open to everyone, even if you don't have a child um, with special needs, and they're actually working to make those parent workshops have built-in childcare so the kids will go on a Zoom online field trip simultaneously while parents attend the workshop. So there was a question in the chat about best ways to help support families and that is a really good way. Okay, thanks. So I talked a little bit about how we've been speaking with districts and teachers and how best to support them. So we have our hands on a lot of different pieces in terms of district support. And this is just a really quick snapshot of some of the different trainings that I've been doing that has been personalized um, to teachers and district needs. So we've been working um, with PVOSD to do a series on classroom management. Um, we're helping to support Bonnie Dune Elementary School because of the closures due to the fire. Um, I've also been advising with different districts and schools during staff meetings, such as Mountain Elementary, um, and again, we've been working with North County SELPA on a series on personalizing distance learning to best meet the needs of students with special needs and the ability to customize distance learning to meet their needs. We also have a series coming up uh, to support English language learners called EL RISE. And so, uh, and for those folks who don't, do not know what the SELPA is, it's a special education local plan uh, area. And so it's basically, uh, a regional program to support special education students, teachers, and families as well. And Debbie will talk a little about our supporting special groups specifically, because I know this came up a lot in the chat, uh, and also, you know, pre-K, as well as students of, of, with disabilities. So right now there is legislation that will allow for small groups to come back and have in-person support. And, um, just know that each district is working on this and approaching this separately. So we don't have a countywide approach right now. And so if you have specific questions for your district, we can certainly gather those and ask. Um, but we don't have a countywide uh, rule right now about bringing back special groups. However, the good news is that students who are in pre-K, um, we are doing a ton of support for them. We have a division in our ed services department the Child Development Resource Center, CDRC, and also our child development programs. And we are working really hard to ensure that students are still getting childcare needs and preschool needs. And then students with disabilities and English learners, uh, districts are working now to determine plans to bring back some of those students for some in-person learning so that they do not have to rely on Zoom and so that they can get some of the therapy and some of the support that they need that really is difficult to do through distance learning. So each district, again, is working on creating a plan for that to start to bring back students 
and so that they can get some in-person support to really make sure that those kids who are not thriving in distance learning are getting the support that they need. So more yeah, to follow definitely. with that. This is just, this has all happened just very recently. And so districts are working on this right now and launching different programs to bring students back onto campus. And, and just, just to give you some background on that one, the governor uh, released a statement that uh, if you're in, um, uh, if you're in the restricted environment uh, during this pandemic, which our county was uh, just as of two weeks ago, about a week and a half ago, uh, uh, no schools can open. Um, and about a week and a half ago or so, California Public Health then change the rules, say, well, you can have special small group cohorts. So at first there's nobody can have school based upon where we were at. And just about a week and a half ago, California Department of Public Health, uh, in collaboration with this with the governor's office, say, okay, now schools can open with small group cohorts. Well, again, we're building that plan as we fly it. We don't want to jump in that plane while it's flying. We want to make sure we have a plan and uh, a developed process to get those students in these small group cohorts before we fully open. All right, and so with that, um, finally, I know there was a question from the forum uh, about volunteers and partners. Um, just really quick, because I know we're running out of time, we're developing a toolkit uh, for volunteer support. Uh, right now, there's a lot of staff at the school districts that uh, have been to do volunteer work, to do the work of volunteers that volunteers would have done in the classroom. For example, school bus drivers. There's not many routes that bus drivers have to take right now, so they're being reassigned to support the classroom, is one example. Um, there's other staff, office staff for school districts that have been reassigned to support classrooms as well. So there's been a lot of work on shifting people's duties and jobs uh, to support instruction. And uh, with that, uh, we are, it is time for Q&A, which I think uh, Nicole uh, and Christine have a big list of questions for us. But if you want to contact us at any time, uh, Ferris's email is up there. My email, Jason Borgen's up there. Debbie's email is up there as is Stephanie's email. Uh, and finally, I do wanna end with this quote from the Distance Learning Playbook. Um, Regardless of where we're at, what we're doing, us educators have embraced this no matter what format we're at. Our focus as educators and all across the county is to support students, period. And thank you for your time today. Thank you so much, Ferris and Jason and Debbie and Stephanie, um, there was so much good and useful information um, in that presentation. And so we're going to try to, I know, I know that you all, you actually did a great job trying to touch on some of the questions that were, that were coming up in the chat box uh, as we were going along. We'll try to pull out some of the ones that maybe didn't um, get addressed or where there might, it might be helpful to get a little bit of follow-up or, or a deeper answer. And then for those of you, if you have asked a question and if we don't get to it in today's chat, just know that we will ask the COE team to help provide some answers that we can send out as part of the follow-up email that we send after every coffee chat. So even if you don't hear your question being addressed in this live session, we will do our best to get an answer to that. Um, and first I wanna actually ask, is there anyone that's listening on the Spanish channel that would like to ask a question in Spanish, and Stella can translate it for us. We'll pause for just a moment to see. Stella, I don't see, okay. Don't see anybody uh, wanting to ask a question in Spanish. So um, let me pull out a couple of the ones here. Um, one of them is asking about um, kind of the approach to students that maybe aren't attending or participating regularly, and there may be a variety of reasons why. It might be digital equity and access issues. It might be just um, that there aren't other family members or people that are able to support or even supervise the distance learning during the day. Um, and so it's, it's being framed as a kind of a professional development and coaching issue or question. So is, is there any sensitivity training around equity issues that's being provided um, to teaching staff. There's a, this question actually came through in a private chat. Uh, a parent recently uh, shared that she was being reprimanded by her child's teacher for not caring enough about her child's education because uh, the parent couldn't be present and also connected online while the child was learning during the day because the parent was working. 
So the question is, what can be done to better support parents to support their children while they are also busy working? So uh, a, a couple pieces to that. I think number one is, is ensuring staff and teachers are trained on how to individualize and personalize instruction. And so on that end, uh, we are launching a personalized learning uh, uh, strand of uh, training sessions for teachers on really how to support the individual styles with different types of needs, whether it be uh, learning time of the day when both parents work, whether it be uh, instructional uh, disabilities or, or learning disabilities specifically. Uh, uh, and, and to really divide, uh, provide a plan for teachers to individualize and personalize learning experiences for the students based upon their needs. And so I think that that's number one is making sure teachers are aware of those strategies and how to support individual students based upon their home lives and what they're dealing with at home and or with their family. Uh, so that's, that's on the, the uh, training the teacher side. As far as supporting the parents, uh, we're working closely with, with um, uh, partner agencies uh, for example, like Triple P uh, is a great example of that, um, and other agencies that work directly with families uh, uh, on on uh, best practices on supporting your child uh, at a distance, um, including we're, we're also, you know, we started a September parent newsletter. We're going to continue that with strategies and best practices where parents can learn on their own as well. Um, and then finally, um, one of the, uh, and we mentioned this in the legislative mandates, uh, live interaction with students. That live interaction can take on several forms. Not every child can get on a Zoom at 8.30 a.m. Uh, so it gives the teacher the opportunity to have another live interactive session. A live interactive session can be a phone call with the family member or the parent. And all that data just needs to be entered into a management system so uh, it's clear that if the child had a live interaction with that teacher. And that live interaction doesn't have to be a Zoom. It could be a phone call. Debbie or Stephanie, do you want to add anything on I, that? I would just add briefly that um, this, this is something that is really critical to the work that the county office is doing, um, as Jason mentioned, with a lot of professional development for teachers and a lot of support for parents. But I would also reiterate to parents that you have to advocate for your child and you have to contact your child's teacher and you have to contact your child's uh, principal or district if you have concerns as well. So... Um, the county office, it, you know, we are an umbrella organization. We are here to support absolutely. And parents also really need to reach out if you have concerns with your child's teacher or your child's school to also please reach out to the school, to the administration, to the teacher directly, to, because they, you know, they may not know that you have these concerns as well. So I always would, I would always advocate reaching out directly um, if you have concerns, but we are, again, we are absolutely here to support with, with professional development um, and other ways as well. And in terms of it being handled or, or viewed as a kind of attendance and disciplinary issue, is that, are there any changes or differences in how that's being viewed or handled in light of some of these barriers to distance learning? So, so you know, okay. Go ahead, Debbie. You want to talk about the, the plan? So every, yeah, every school, every district has come up. They have to create an engagement plan and an attendance plan. And they have to also, in their learning continuity plan, they have to address how they will support students who are not being successful and how, and perhaps who are not attending or engaged due to different reasons. And so again, it's not a countywide approach. It's a, it's a district approach. But that is absolutely something that the districts and the school sites are accountable for. And they, they've been working really hard on that. And I know that's a major concern for our schools and districts that they want to make sure all the students are engaged, that they have the technology that they need, um, and that they are being successful. So, but again, it's not a countywide effort. It's individual by district. Great. Thank you for that. Um, there are a couple comments that came through in the chat, just a, a lot of appreciation for the resources for families on the COE's webpage. There's one um, suggestion or question about can the translate button be moved so it's more visible or more readily visible. Um, but then also questions about um, what are some of the steps being taken to make sure that uh, groups like DLAC, and I forget what that acronym stands for, um, 
but to actually make sure that parents are aware of and know how to find these resources. I know you all touched on that, but I'm wondering if you can maybe elaborate that on a bit more and, and what kind of role we all could play in helping uh, make sure that families know how to access this information. So the DLAC is the District English, Lang English Language Advisory Group or Advisory Club or advi what's the C for, Jason? Com committee. Committee, thank you. Um, and so um, depending on the English learner population of a school, they have to have an ELAC, which is the English Learner Advisory Committee. And then depending upon the population of the district, they are also responsible to have a DLAC. And so again, that would be something that would that you would need to look at on the district webpage or a school site webpage for information about ELACs and DLACs because that's not something that the county office, uh, we don't run that. We do, however, have an um, English learner coordinator, Sophia Sorensen, and she is on our website and she does a huge amount of work with support for English learners. So that is definitely a resource that, um, and I believe she's also, she has a page on our distance learning website as well. And so that is another place to go to find support to, uh, for English learners in Santa Cruz. And Debbie talked a little bit about advocating uh, for your child in, 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 in you know, focus areas. All the uh, district's um, learning and attendance and accountability plan are, will be on the district's websites. And you know, I'm assuming most of your districts have, have submitted uh, surveys or other requests for, for feedback. And so we just encourage you to submit those forms and submit that feedback directly to your schools and districts around how they're going to be developing this plan and what the needs are in your community. I just wanted to add um, in terms of making sure that people know where the resources are and how to access them. Um, that is something that we're constantly working on and refining to make sure that the organization of the distance learning website is clear. Um, and I actually on the parent guide the newest parent newsletter and there's a little video tour of our distance learning website that guides you through how to find the different resources for families um, that I recorded but we are that is the concern uh, we're, we're constantly working on how to refine it and make it better so thanks for asking that question and on that too there is a feedback link on the distance learning website please use it to give us some feedback because we want to know what would be better uh, are relevant and beneficial to families and the community members. So we encourage you to use this feedback button to give us feedback as well. So it's under the more button and there should be a link called feedback and that'll take you directly to this Google form. And you can do this anonymously or you can just put, uh, this requires your email address here, but if you wanna, um, just so we can give you guys, uh, we can respond back to you once it's completed. Great, and then a couple uh, more concrete questions and suggestions. One is about um, students that are running out of data on their hotspots. And just a question about, is there the opportunity to uh, get more data or multiple, um, multiple hotspots per family if there are multiple children, multiple students? So, you know, I'm not sure what district this, this person is referencing, but most districts have purchased unlimited hotspots with unlimited data. And so uh, one hotspot for three students should suffice. Um, and if it's not, then uh, I think requesting from the district, directly connecting with the district and letting them know the concerns you have would be uh, a great uh, uh, process to, to go to, to ensure the child is getting, all your children are getting what they need. Um, if you're coming up with some caps, it may be um, an issue with that district purchasing a, a non-unlimited data plan and just have a conversation with them, letting them know the concerns. If, if, people, if students are on Zoom, it takes up a lot of data. And so just a quick hour of Zoom will be a, a data suck. Um, and so we recommend with all districts, we're talking with all districts to purchase the devices with unlimited data. And so you're not restricted for the data. And also, you know, giving the students the ability to, to, to connect uh, at the parent's discretion to personal connections online as well at home. We want the child to use these devices uh, as a device to connect and learn from, and not only you know, uh, academically, but just recreationally as well. Great. And then along those lines, and this one's more of a, maybe kind of a question, kind of a request. Um, and if you all know that the interpretation feature, like what we're using today, is great and it's not available on Chromebooks. And so um, if there's any kind of role that the COE can play in helping advocate 
for <laughs> Pester Zoom to make that a feature that's available. That'd be great because there are several, um, you know, we know that so many of the students are using Chromebooks, but also uh, many organizations that are trying to support parents and families through bilingual meetings uh, makes it really hard to, or, you know, parent teacher meetings makes it really hard to do uh, without that interpretation capability. So, you know, there's a little unknown piece of a lot of folks don't, under, don't realize that Chromebooks actually can install Android apps on them. And the Android Zoom app does support translation. So if the Android app on the Chromebook, you could actually have access to the, um, to the uh, translation feature via the Android app. Because translation does work through the Android app as well. That is good to know. We'll uh, have some, some people try that out with us to that we can do, uh, prepare people for next time. It's great. Um, we maybe have time for uh, one more question. Let me scroll through the ones that have been asked. Um, actually, why don't we do this for our last question? I'm gonna invite, would anybody like to unmute themselves to ask a question out loud that you feel hasn't been addressed yet by our, our speakers? Jason, if you want to unshare your screen, you guys have a chance to see more participants. You can either, and if so, if you'd like to unmute yourself to ask a question, you can either <laughs> raise your hand in your camera or use your participant window. So I see Kara or Kara. Yeah, Kara Myberg Guzman. Um, I'm a reporter from Santa Cruz Local. And I am wondering what more does the county, county Office of Ed need to move towards digital equity and what can the city councils and board of supervisors do to help push the county towards digital equity? Uh, in, so from a perspective of infrastructure, uh, we need funds to, to increase our efforts and increase the, the amount of personnel that's installing um, um, high, high, high speed internet services to little areas, Cruzeo, um, uh, works through what they call Wi-Fi tech, uh, infrastructure technology, where they have antennas on different buildings, and it has to have line of sight from one antenna to connect. And so our work with Cruzo has been limited because in, in, you know, in, in flat areas in Santa Cruz County, it works great because you can get line of sight from one building to the next in pretty far distances. Other places uh, in the county, it's very, very difficult. Bonnie Dune, um, uh, San Lorenzo Valley, um, other, some places in, in, in La Selva. And, and down in, in the rolling hills of Soquel as well. And so uh, we need more efforts and infrastructure and, 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 and funds to, to increase these efforts and increase these partnerships with, 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 um, with networking companies, um, internet service providers, both in the area and outside the areas to work with us to build this infrastructure out. That's a great question, Kara. Anybody else have a burning question that you'd like to ask Allison? Hi, everybody. This has been really great. Thank you for your um, amazing dedication um, around this really challenging work. I put this in the chat, but um, I, the parents that I work with, there's been questions coming up about tutoring and about uh, learning support. A lot of us who have resources are bringing that into our homes. Um, that's what's allowing us to stay focused at our jobs and make sure that our children have you know, other support systems and human beings caring for them. And I just think it's, that would be a really great next step. Um, I know you've talked about redeploying bus drivers and other staff, and I think that's awesome. And I just think there's a lot of untapped potential in our community, retired teachers, things like that, that we could be tapping into in an organized way. So I'd love to just hear your thinking about that in terms of next steps and how we organize that as a community. So we are putting together a volunteer toolkit. We want to make sure we do it strategically. And we set that foundation for these volunteers as well at a countywide and regional level and making sure they're, like you said, trained and have a structure and support what their plan is and also do it in a safe and secure way, right? Most districts require all their volunteers to be fingerprinted before they enter into the classroom, physical classroom. It doesn't mean we can't skip that, that process and mandate for, for virtual volunteers as well. So we need to put a safe structure in place as well if, if we have any adults uh, out in the community working directly with students. And so we're working on those practices and policies um, now and putting together a toolkit and a training mechanism at the same time. But it does take time to put together those programs. And I would also just like to add to you that as much as we would love to, to get volunteers to be working with and supervising students, we have to be really careful to always follow the county health guidelines. And so that has to always be in the forefront. 
of making sure that we're really being safe and mindful of the health regulations. So again, when we're working on these different possibilities and how we can redeploy staff, uh, we also have to make sure that we're really, really careful to, to stay within the guidance of our county health department. And I, and I do just want to give a shout out to the uh, Santa Cruz um, Community Foundation who helped fund a lot of these projects. For example, um, a lot of our partnerships with Cruzia was, couldn't have been possible without the Santa Cruz Community Foundation. Um, and they funded this project to increase Cruzia's efforts to put these big outdoor Wi-Fi access points in a lot of these school sites, as well as to increase their efforts to provide these free services for families. So funding you know, through them is, is a great mechanism. Another piece they did is they funded the Cruise One platform, which was a volunteer platform in the spring to support volunteers. And they you know, created a mechanism for us to think for, for paying for them to get fingerprinted uh, to be a volunteer. And so we do have a handful of volunteers who went through the fingerprinting process that's been approved by the county. And we're, we're working on ways to utilize them um, and, and developing these plans. You know, like I said, right now, as you mentioned, Allison, uh, a lot of the, the positions that were needed at face-to-face -face brick and mortar schools have been redeployed to uh, supporting students. So the need hasn't been as great as we once thought it was gonna be. But we know we wanna utilize the community to increase our support for students ultimately. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you all. We are uh, right at the end of our time. So this, uh, this was a longer than usual uh, coffee chat because we knew there would be a lot of information to cover and it still flew by. So um, as you probably saw in the chat, again, a lot of appreciation for the wealth of information and resources that you all shared today. Um, we will share the recording uh, from today and the slides with all these links to resources as part of the follow-up email that I'll send out within the next couple of days. And uh, I would uh, also appreciate it or love it if, if all of you are willing to click on one of those feedback survey links, either in English or Spanish, and share your feedback about today's coffee chat. We do uh, look at those and it helps inform our thinking about future topics and what we can do to, to make them go as smoothly as possible. So we appreciate any and all feedback. And uh, that's it. That is officially the end of our coffee chat today. We have a couple more events coming up this month that I'll include in the follow-up email. And we're constantly thinking of new topics and different speakers. And so if any of you on the call want to be a featured speaker at a, at a future coffee chat, please feel free to reach out to me. So with that, we are officially uh, done. Say goodbye to those of you who need to go. We'll, uh, I'll hang on for a few more minutes Bye. if anybody has some burning questions or comments. Thank you, Jason and Stephanie and Debbie. And I know Ferris had to leave, but pass on our thanks to him as well. Thank you for the opportunity and people's uh, dedication to our students. Yeah, thank you.